Hi, uh, I'm Mesim. I've been working on GKE slash Kubernetes for the past two years now. And today we're gonna to talk about HA services during maintenance. So what that means is, so I don't know if you've heard about all the cool things that Clayton and Kelsey have been talking about. Infrastructure should be boring. So why should node upgrades be any boring? Why should node upgrades not be boring? So let's, let's make them boring. Let's talk about that. So maintenance happens. We all know that. You know, it just does. Uh, there are two primary things that we see in maintenance, involuntary disruptions and voluntary disruptions. Uh, involuntary are unavoidable and undelayable, like disk failures, kernel panics, all of those things happen, network bisections happen, racks get on fire, uh, cooling turns off, fun stuff happens all the time. Uh, voluntary disruptions are more interesting. They have so if you have a security patch that you need to do, you have node upgrades, you have Kubernetes upgrades, there are multiple types of things that you need to do to make sure that you are not compromised or you're not running a really old version and you're not out of support. So how do we do all of that? We're gonna talk about that. So the primary concern about maintenance is that it's fundamentally disruptive. It, you need to replace a node to change the kernel, for example. You need, to, or something equivalent. Uh, they need to be either rebooted or replaced. And when you do that, you fundamentally take out capacity. You need to, your pods are shuffled. Uh, you, how do you prevent against making, like all those, like when workloads are shuffled, you need to make sure that your, when your pod is going down, you need to be sure that you fulfill all, any incoming requests, any requests that are already in flight. Uh, it could take an hour for you to fulfill that request. So you should be very careful when taking down those pods. Uh, like you want to be sure that you have enough capacity. You don't have downtime, and you are not. And the fun part begins. I don't know if you saw the Nordstrom truck. Uh, they talk about how you could end up in a split brain mode uh, where etcd, you have two different sets of etcds talking about uh, doing different things and they have different information. Who's right, who's wrong? How do you, you don't want to be in that state. That state is very messy. So, so what are your options for maintenance? Uh, you can accept downtime. Uh, that is horrible. You don't want to say, you don't want to tell your users, hey, we're doing a maintenance event and we want you to come back after an hour. That's not okay. Uh, and it could also lead to under application or if you have a service that's uh, like a memory cache and you don't flush it properly, well, you're gonna have data loss. You could be in a very weird state for a long time. And it, getting out of that is gonna be costly. Another approach that you can take is you can have a completely replicated cluster, which is just an active failover. And as soon as something goes wrong, you need to uh, move on to that. But that takes human effort, that takes time, and it's not that straightforward. Federation or multi-cluster will make it better, but it's still fundamentally hard. At Google, what we do is we say we should write applications that are maintenance tolerant. They, Maintenance will happen, like I said, and you, what <laughs> you need, you should just be prepared. Uh, however, it does obviously come with extra maintenance cost, uh, extra developer cost, because you need to think about all the different failure scenarios, what happens if uh, you're fulfilling a request and you crashed, and all that. And just like writing a distributed application, you should also realize that you're running on distributed infrastructure. That means the same principles that apply to your applications also apply to the infrastructure that things will go down, things will move. So if you go with approach three, you can build more automation. You can have things automatically move across uh, nodes or across resources. And the great thing about that is, is Kubernetes is built for that. That's why you should, it's great that you're here and let's talk about how we can make this better. 
So with that, I'm going to introduce Eric. Eric has been working on the app workloads, and uh, he has a lot of experience in Kubernetes. He's been working on it pre-GA, pre-1.0, actually. So here's Eric. Thanks, Masam. Thanks, Masam. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to, if you have decided you want to um, build maintenance tolerance applications, then Kubernetes offers you a number of different tools. And our, our underlying philosophy is um, of, so th there's two different boxes of tools. One is for application owners and one is for cluster owners. And the reason we think about splitting um, the roles in the cluster into two parts uh, is to allow two things. One is if you have many different teams deploying microservices into a single cluster, it's not, not always practical for the it's not always practical for the cluster operator to understand all of them. And if you want to uh, automate cluster operations, such as GKE is increasingly doing, then you need to have a clear um, contract between cluster operators and application owners. Application owners understand what the availability model, quorum, whatever the requirements are, how long it takes things to drain, whereas the cluster operator just needs to understand these things in the abstract. So the application owner's tools are graceful termination, which I want to encourage everyone to understand and use if you haven't used it before. And, and graceful termination says, when you, says to the person who is doing maintenance, be patient with my application. Here's how patient you have to be. Let me know when you're gonna, uh, when you're gonna turn me off. It gives you a chance to let requests complete, and it gives you time to flush or commit state you know, to a local disk or to a remote store. Now, the, the pro move is to use pod disruption budgets, which we'll also talk about in demo here today. And pod disruption budgets allow you to say, not only be patient, but be careful. Don't take too many of my instances down at once. This prevents loss of quorum, which causes unavailability, and it can prevent losing all your replicas of a state store um, before they can flush state, which could cause undurability, for lack of a better word. So graceful termination, I'll go through the timeline of what happens. So if a user or controller deletes a pod via the REST API, uh, anytime you want to like scale down, you say delete something, uh, you're rolling out a new thing, it's all doing a pod delete because pods don't really get <laughs> um, modified, they just get deleted. It doesn't delete from the REST API when you delete it. It just gets a deletion timestamp set in the metadata header. So then a bunch of things in Kubernetes are gonna notice that it's pending to delete. Kubla's gonna send a sig term and it's gonna run the pre-stop handlers if you have any for your pod. The endpoints can get removed from the service and then you're gonna stop load balancing to that instance, but it's not gonna get killed yet. The pod's gonna get reported and it's not ready, so you can see that in your UIs. Um, but the Kubla's gonna wait for a certain amount of time. The default is 30 seconds, but I would encourage you if you have stateful applications to set a longer pod.spec.termination grace period seconds. You can set that as long as you want. Um, the Kubla, will, after that time period is exceeded, it's gonna send a sig kill, because it'll assume, well maybe if it's waited longer than it said it needed, then it must be wedged. Um, or if the application exits sooner, then, um, you know, the, the kubelet's immediately gonna clean it up. So when the application has either reached the end of its period or it's exited already, the kubelet's gonna clean up all its resources and then f which really makes sure it's completely dead. And the last thing it's gonna do is delete it from the REST API. So like how, how should you as an application owner understand this? So you're gonna want, one option is to handle a uh, sig term or you can use a pre-stop handler if your main image is like someone else wrote it and they didn't think about handling sig term. Um, you're gonna, when you get either the sig term or the pre-stop, you're gonna wanna flush any state to, to the disk if you're relying on local storage or if you have peers that you need to like, you know, send shards to or you know, uh, decommission yourself, you're gonna wanna do that. Um, and then you're gonna wanna finish out standing requests and there's two ways you can do that. One is you just don't do anything and you let Kubernetes service automatically remove you from the endpoint so that new requests don't come to you, and you just keep handling existing requests as you normally would, so it's just no action. There is a little bit of delay, so if you wanna like be faster or more agile, then you can actually start um, refusing new connections immediately with something like HTTP to go away. But that's like, that's for, you don't have, you don't have to do that. 
That's, um, so the way that you, so I would definitely encourage everyone to look into uh, graceful termination. If you're running stateful services on Kubernetes and you want to be able to run node upgrades across those, like some people I talked to today are running etcd on Kubernetes, and then they have all their servers depending on that. You really want to make sure you don't lose quorum for etcd while you're updating the nodes. So for that, I encourage you to create a pod disruption budget object for your etcd cluster. So a set. So this is a long name. I like to say PDB because whoever thought of pod disruption budgets um, didn't have RSI, I guess. Um, so it's a, a set of replicated pods, which are selected by a label selector, has a budget, which is how many can be down at once due to disruptions. So stateful sets, you can use it with, you can use the deployments, they don't have to be stateful. You can use it with an operator like etcd operator, um, anything that you can select as a group with labels. And I think we already talked about why you'd want to use these, quorum, uh, ensuring a sufficient load for like a stateless service. Um, So what, what types of deletion actions are going are to respect this budget that you've set, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, if you use the kubectl drain command or you're using GK node upgrades, which Mossum's going to demo later, uh, then it's going to respect the budget that you set. Obviously, if like a pod just is destroyed because the machine is destroyed, we can't stop that. Um, if someone directly deletes a pod, we're just going to honor that immediately. Um, or if you're rolling out a new version concurrently with node upgrades, which is possible, that's not going to count against the budget because you're because you've said you wanted to upgrade. Uh, so the way that you say that you want to delete something carefully and nicely is by using the eviction sub resource. We actually don't have a great command to do that directly, but what it does is says if there's enough of these pods in this group, then delete it with grace period. Otherwise, it's going to send you back a 429 that says, try again later. So normally, you won't need to do this manually, um, but you can figure it out if you want. Um, let's see. Normally, you're going to be using it in conjunction with a kubectl drain command or GK node upgrades or some other cloud provider if once they're ready to implement the same node upgrade flow. So there's two ways you can define it. Um, I like min available. Um, so min available is the first is good if you um, are using um, like an operator, which doesn't have a scale sub resource. Um, max unavailable is easier for something that you're scaling up and down frequently, like a deployment because it has a scale sub-resource. And you can, so min, un, min available saying like, I need at least two out of three to have quorum. Max unavailable is saying like, I can handle 10% being down at any given time because even though I'm scaling up and down due to load, I still have a 10% buffer. And I'm, I've reserved that additional 10% um, for the possibility of losing capacity due, a node, due to a node upgrade. So Mossum's gonna talk more about the draining process and then do a demo, thanks. Thank you, Eric. So uh, we're going to talk about draining a node 101. It's essentially a wrapper. This is essentially how kubectl drain works. And the first thing that you need to do before you drain a node is coordinate. You really don't want anything being scheduled on top of it when, it's, when you're doing an active drain. If you get more pods on it, that means that is bad because you just started a drain. Anyways, so instead of deleting pods that are on that node, you should evict them using the eviction subsidy resource. And when you do that, you, you could block forever. Uh, GKE, uh, Kubernetes engine, uh, blocks it for one hour uh, before violating the PDB because at some point we do need to move forward. And we recommend that cloud providers do something similar, maybe one hour, maybe four hours, whatever they prefer. Uh, so another point to make on that is what happens, the reason you want to violate the PDB after one hour is if your kubelet on that node is dead. If it's not respecting anything, if it's not there, if it's not present, and it's not taking any actions that you ask it to take, then you're essentially running a black box that you know is not performing. 
So in that scenario, we do want to move forward at some point. Uh, <clears throat> we want to wait for all the pods to terminate by the grace period. So let's say if you have a pod that takes 30 minutes to terminate, that's fine. But if it takes six hours, your cloud provider might, might not be fine with that. So on GKE, we cap this at one hour. If you have any concerns, please let us know, and we will retweak that. And uh, so it's per pod, not per node. So if you have five pods which have a PDB associated with it, and you can only take down two at a time, so it'll be about two, uh, three hours total, or four pods if you have so. Uh, okay. So yeah. Oh, and you should, because Kubernetes is a distributed model and there's so many actors playing on the same node or the same objects, you should be very careful when you, <clears throat> after you've drained, drained a node, you should go back and check that it's actually properly drained. If not, you should repeat everything again. Otherwise, you don't know what's going on. So with that, uh, I'm gonna show how that actually looks like. So this is <clears throat> a Cassandra stateful set uh, and a web server deployment, both have three replicas. Uh, PDBs with max unavailable is set to one on both of them. So I don't want to take down more than 33% of capacity from either my Cassandra workloads or my web servers. Okay. So that's the controller which uh, starts doing uh, the eviction. <clears throat> First it's gonna set it to unschedulable and then it's gonna start draining start evicting pods. So that's evicting, evicting. Over there, as you can see, we don't have any disruptions left. We have no way we can move forward right now. What will happen is that the API server will reject the request. It'll say that, no, I'm not gonna allow you to move forward right now. Uh, at that point, the cloud provider is supposed to back off and wait for it to, or it can keep retrying after every few seconds or whatever, until all the pods replicate. So one thing to note over here is uh, in a deployment, your web server, a, rep, a, a new pod for the web server will show up, can show up even prior to your evicted pod terminating. That is key because that does not happen in a stateful set. What happens in a stateful set is that until this replica goes down completely, the other one won't show up. And what's not shown over here is that it will come up with the same identity. So if it was Cassandra zero, it will show up with Cassandra zero again. And now if you do an evict, it'll succeed and it'll get rescheduled. And one thing to note is at this point, it is still not safe to delete the, the node object from Kubernetes. You should never delete the node object and let the node controller delete it. At least on GCE, that's what happens. I'm not sure if other cloud providers do something similar. The reason is you actually wanna make sure that the node has left the network, is no longer active before you delete it. So you like you should check the, against a cloud provider if the node still exists. <clears throat> yeah, that's drained and you can see that we're, we're fine. So with that, I'm gonna do a short demo of how uh, it should how we should do these things, and that is I have a recorded demo because no drains do take a long time. So uh, just so that I am right, let me tell you what the setup looks like. So it is a Cassandra stateful set on this demo. It's, uh, it's, it has five replicas. It has a PDB set for max and available one. So you can, I can only take down one replica at a time. Uh, this, it has a simple replication strategy across the, in Cassandra. It's set to three replicas. That means each data uh, is replicated thrice. Uh, the HTTP server is just a deployment which uh, uses GoSQL and talks to Cassandra directly. <clears throat> It also has five replicas and max and available set to two. Uh, it essentially means that I can take, I can reduce capacity up to like 60%. Uh, oh, sorry, down to 60%. Yeah, and we do quorum writes and single reads. 
that I, I just want to get the whatever the latest value was, and I want a quarter rate. And this is a list. It's not a get in the sense that it's going to be listing all resources. For that, let me show you what it looks like on GKE. So this is sped up, so you should. Uh, that is, it's hitting QPS at 700 or something uh, or so, and then we're starting to drain. And as you can see, it'll remain steady. It's boring. You don't have to care about this. That's the whole point. You're going to see that the pods are getting shuffled. Cassandra just got rescheduled. Uh, the web server has not been rescheduled yet. And once a node comes back up, the second node would go offline or start, and that's scheduling. And you can see Cassandra 2 was rescheduled. And all this is happening, and you have steady QPS, and everything works. So with that, I guess, do you have, uh, yeah, you can watch the entire thing. <laughs> it's boring, essentially. <laughs> And questions? So, yeah. So just, just to emphasize, you had a web server that was talking to a database. It was getting 600 queries per second. And you were rebooting all of your nodes while that was happening. And it was not dropping any requests. Yeah. Including the ones that had your database on it. Yeah. Everything was getting rescheduled. Everything was on those nodes. And it still worked. Your budget allowed it two instances down, and at the same time, we might have some unpredictable disaster, so your cluster would be screw screwed, right? Uh, not necessarily. So uh, if you take down, so the web server, can, you can only take down one at a time, oh, sorry, two at a time. That means at worst, even if a disaster happens, you're down to 40% capacity. Uh, on the Cassandra, the PDB is set to, you can only take down one at a time. That means if a disaster happens, you're still above quorum. You're still at quorum. Uh, is there any way to define a default pod disruption budget, like per namespace, or? Uh, I'm not sure. Is it? That, that is an open request, and I will take your comment as a plus one to get that done uh, soon. Great. Plus two. <laughs> All right. A any more pluses for that? Um, wow, so one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven, eight. Cool. So m more than 10 people raised their hands saying that they will use that if we do that in a future release. That is good feedback. Thank you. Um, so for kubectl drain command, if a PDB exceeded, does that command will fail or uh, block? Kubectl does not, block, uh, does not uh, violate the PDB at all. It will keep waiting forever if, it, if it, that's what's needed. So it, so it will be blocked? It will be blocked. OK, thank you. Yeah. So if my Cassandra cluster was using a local volume, and then if you do these operations, then the Cassandra node will not be moved to a different host? Uh, it will. I'm not sure about that. Um, are, are you going to do a, uh, a disruptive move where the data will be replicated again? Because I think in, in this case, you might be moving the, the persistent volume. Actually, I'm not. Oh, you're not? Yeah. Oh, uh, so in this case, the, the new Cassandra node comes up, and then they do the replication again? Yes. Uh, it, okay. It's decommissioned, and a new one comes up. OK. Uh, can, so, so we so can do it. Two, there's two possibilities. Yeah. One is that whenever you, like, you have no storage migration other than Cassandra, in which case you would want your Cassandra nodes to handle um, the, de like, the de termination notice by. Um, so it does de it right now. Decommissioning themselves? Yeah, we do a pre stop hook, which, at least in the demo, it does a note to uh, dec decommission. Oh, I see. And then it uh, cleans out the. PVC and then moves on. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk to you more about it after. Yeah. 
So one issue we ran into when using PDBs was that the readiness check wasn't actually correct. So in the case where you're migrating Cassandra or even SCD, right, um, your second pod could be ready, but it may not have joined Quorum yet. So if you are, and then, then it will allow the uh, PDB will actually be satisfied and allow a third node to be taken down. So the issue here is uh, if you rewrite your readiness check to consider Quorum, then you have a scale up issue where when, you're, when your three Cassandra is coming up, the first Cassandra doesn't have Quorum and then you can't scale up again. So how do you like balance this fact? It's like a very small time frame, but when you have network partitions, for example, your node could report ready but they don't have quorum, and then you will, your PDB will allow you to lose quorum on a subsequent uh, termination. Uh, I didn't catch the part about what happens if you uh, account for the ready, uh, account for quorum in the readiness check. Sure. So, like um, the naive solution we did was like we just simply made the readiness check report quorum instead of the node server health. Mm -hmm. But then, if the default um, stateful set rollout uh, scheme is that your uh, Cassandra zero must be uh, ready before it will scale Cassandra one. So you, it won't, it will just essentially block roll out. So I'd say Cassandra is one of the trickier applications to make work with stateful sets. I would probably write an operator for Cassandra that, and possibly have like a sidecar that ran with the Cassandra that like could detect from the identity or communication with the operator what state it was in. I see. Um, and if that's something, how many people would like the project to write a really great Cassandra operator? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, seven, eight, nine. So ten, ten ish people would, would use one if we wrote one. All right, that's good feedback. Thanks. Cool, thanks. That's, a, that's a good, tricky corner case. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? If not, then I guess we're done. Thank you.